If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to open with me to Hebrews chapter 3. And this is where we began last week in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We're picking up exactly where we left off, and we're going to, Lord willing, get through 7 through 19. But as you're turning there, I want you to think about those words that we're just saying together. That when you turn your eyes upon Christ, it is strange. It is strange the way that everything else around you is diminished. I think that's one of the things that is common throughout the book of Hebrews. That as we run this race, as we live a life that is aimed to please Christ, and we have our lives and our eyes, our soul fixated on the person of Christ, not in some superficial sense, but in the depth of way he is described here, that all of our problems, the world, they don't disappear, but they are diminished because we understand that that is not the fight. The fight is not against the world. The fight is not against your circumstances. The fight is not against family. The fight is not against your spouse. There is a greater fight that Hebrews tells us about. I want you to think about the greatest fight that you've ever been able to watch. Not that I do because this, it seems somewhat demonic, but I remember watching, a, I mean, somebody told me about this fight. Uh, <laughs> but you remember the, the big Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson just match up, just everything surrounding that. Listen, like, I just don't think MMA or the fights today, I don't think they have what we had like back in the 90s with just these grudge matches and uh, then you go back even further and it's like they box with bricks instead of boxing gloves. I mean, they just like strap bricks around their hands and, and get after it. But I want you to think about just that greatest fight and that matchup. I don't know if there's a better story though that surrounds back in the 30s of James J. Braddock. Anybody ever heard of Jim Braddock? All right, maybe you don't know that name, but uh, there's a movie about him called Cinderella Man. And Russell Crowe pr plays uh, Jim uh, Braddock, but Braddock was obviously an incredible boxer, but then in the 20s, he kind of lost his edge. All right, he loses in 1929 for the title, and then... All of a sudden, Black Tuesday hits. You know, Black Tuesday on October 29th of 1929, it changed the trajectory of America. There was not one person who was not impacted or influenced, not only in that time, but there's not one person that is not impacted or at least should be influenced by what happened on Black Tuesday. And on that day, no one uh, was left untouched by the destruction of that day, especially Jim Braddock, this boxer. He started working multiple jobs. He was in the coal mines one day. He was on the uh, docks another day, just doing anything that he can, multiple shifts a day, multiple jobs a week, just trying to feed his family. Finally, in 1934, he gets another chance to fight again for the title. And he goes into this ring and, and the odds are 10 to one. Braddock is not supposed to win this fight and yet he pulls it off. A reporter goes up to him, you can see this in the movie, he goes up to him and says, Braddock, what are you fighting for? And he comes back with this simple answer, he says, milk. I'm fighting for milk for my kids because I can't feed them. 
We're in extreme poverty, and I don't know what else to do. I don't know where else to turn. I'm fighting for them. And everything changed in his life. Here's what is interesting about this fight. This fight goes to show that when you understand the purpose of why you're fighting, it changes everything. Just to be the best fighter is not going to do it. Just have the greatest business is not going to do it. Just to have the most money is not going to do it. Just to be able to buy that car or to have this education or to have X, Y, Z, whatever the earth could give you, that is not enough. It's not enough to keep you going. It's not enough to keep you in the faith. But rather, we must understand what the greater fight is. We have to know what this fight is about if we want to walk with Christ and in the abundant life. This is what verse 7, tying in the previous passage teaches us. And so if you have your copy of God's word, I want to just invite you to stand up with me if you're willing to and if you're able to. It says this, starting in verse 7, going through verse 19. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage each other daily while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end, the reality that we had at the start. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it all who came out of Egypt under Moses? With whom was God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that we were unable to enter because of unbelief. Let's pray. God, would you help us now to understand your word? And Father, that we would not harden our hearts, but rather we would hear your voice and that you would speak to us clearly today. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated once again. If you have your Bible open to that passage, I want to remind you of where we left last week. And I want to read verse 6 to you. It says uh, in Hebrews 3 verse 6, it says, But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if... Indeed, we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. In our passage today, we have another if statement. And these are statements that we have to really pay attention to. These statements that should actually cause us to some degree tremble. And you're thinking, okay, well, you're just being a little dramatic. That's what preacher boys do every now and then. You get dramatic. But I want you to hear that again. But Christ is faithful over God's house 
as a son, and we are his house if, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. We don't often think about conditional ideas with God. In fact, we have almost overly emphasized unconditional elements and unconditional ideas that may or may not be very biblical. We think about the unconditional love of God We think about the unconditional favor of God. We think about the unconditional election of God. We think about these things in terms that uh, have no uh, condition on us individually. Now, I want to be clear about this. Listen, I'm a sola fide guy. Like, I believe that um, salvation is by faith. It is by the grace of God. And it is only through our faith in him that you and I can be saved. There is no condition on your part that you could muster up any type of righteousness in order to earn God's love, his favor, his salvation, or his hand to continue in your life. There's nothing you can do. But what about this if statement? If you are God's house, if you hold fast if you stand firm, if you press on, if you continue. We, we tend to remove this because this is the scary part of our faith. And yet, it is a theme throughout the book of uh, Hebrews. In fact, I believe that verse 6 is being played out and is being kind of fleshed out to a degree in verses 7 through 19, and then through the rest of the book. Because through the rest of the book, we're going to see these themes. Endure. Persevere. Press on. Finish the race. Run the race that has been set before you. These are if. And this if statement should cause you and I to really introspectively look at where our heart really is. Now, I want us to be clear about this. You see, this condition here is not a condition of becoming, but rather it is a condition of being. And this is the kindness of God in our lives. How cruel would it be for God to save you and to give you absolutely no confidence or or assurance in your salvation? So if there is nothing you can do to come to Christ, that even in our own wickedness, it requires the Spirit of God to turn your heart and your attention toward the things of God, that left off in your own wickedness, you would never choose God. But praise be to God that he would grab our hearts, that he would grab your ears, that he would grab your minds and say, look at what is good. This is why that warning, don't harden your heart if you hear his voice. This testing, this if clause is a gracious gift of God to know whether or not you belong to him or not. It is a condition of being, not becoming. Every time I stand before you and I have a grammatical error in my speaking, which is very common. Some of you have graciously let me know but no grudges. But when I say things like bold peanuts, or I gotta get the oil changed in my car, some of you look at me funny. You see, that's not a condition of me becoming a southerner. It's just a condition of me being one. And the same with many of you. 
And the same with us as we walk with Christ. It is not a condition of us becoming, but rather it is just a way that you can notice whether or not yourself or others around you are in the faith. You see how this is a gift from God? That we could actually have a metric, we could actually have an, a, an assurance and a confidence to know whether or not we are saved? Praise be to God that he would ever allow us to have a tool to introspectively search our heart and, and look to others to figure out whether or not we belong to the house of God that he alone built. This is where he left us. But he said, if you're going to know these things, if you're going to have these things, then you must understand that there is a fight. You fight in this testing. And if we are going to fight, we are going to first fight against disobedience. You want to know whether or not you belong to Christ? Do you fight with everything you got against disobedience? I think one of the greatest Puritans, well, I think the greatest Puritan is Richard Sibbs, but one of the greatest Puritans, John Owen. If you ever have an opportunity to read from John Owen, just start with the mortification of sin because it is where he famously famously says this, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Do you fight against sin? Do you fight against disobedience in your life? Because this is where Hebrews chapter 3, 7 through 11 takes us. It takes us back on a journey with Israel. In fact, he is quoting Psalm chapter 95, verses 7 through 11, in this passage. And he's given us some insight. He's giving us the truth of what happened to Israel and why they had to spend 40 years wandering in complete lostness. He takes us back to understand that Israel continued to harden their hearts. In the beginning of this, the hardening of heart began with simple acts of compromise and simple acts of disobedience. I want you to look at what it says, therefore, in verse 7 of our text today, therefore, as the Holy Spirit said, is that what it says? No, it's not past tense, present tense, as the Holy Spirit says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Talking about Psalm chapter 95, talking about in the days, a post-exilic, a, a post-bondage Israel. They've been taken out, but they hardened their hearts in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, on this day of provocation, provoking God to anger. He says, do not be like them. Now, who is the Holy Spirit talking to in this letter? The church. The ones that we just learned that Jesus is building his house, he's talking to his house, and he says, do not be like them. Don't harden your hearts when you hear the Spirit of God. Don't harden your hearts when you hear the voice of God. And he's given us a tool here to know why and how can we hear the voice of God. You hear the voice of God through the Word of God by the illumination of the Spirit of God. It's not because of something you feel. It's not absent of emotion, but the emotion is not driving the reading of God's word. The spirit of God is driving it. 
Why? Because my emotions will take me anywhere. I could understand this passage to mean this. I could understand the passage to mean this. But your emotion is a poor hermeneutic to study God's word. Cultural bias, a poor hermeneutic to study God's word. We want to know what God says, not what we feel. And he says, as the Holy Spirit says... As he said in the wilderness, as the Spirit of God is saying today, do not harden your hearts. I want you to make this note. Disobedience is not the inability to hear God's voice, but is the unwillingness to hear God's voice because of your own desires. This is what we learn. We're going to leave this up just for a second. But this is what we learn from the wilderness. Is that they, Israel had their own ideas. They had their own desires. And little by little, every act of disobedience was adding a layer of callousness to their heart. And is getting harder and harder and harder and harder to the point that is absolutely unpenetrable by anything. This is the point that Israel got. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, praise be to God, I'm not there. Thank God that I'm not there. Well, listen, we're going to have a test for this in just a moment to know whether or not we are practicing a hardened heart or are we practicing a softening of our heart? Because this is what it says. And as we look to the past of Israel, it says in Exodus 17, 3, it gives us an idea in Exodus 17 of what took place at this testing, at this provocation and provoking God to anger. We see, why did you ever bring us from Egypt, Moses? This was the question they asked. As soon as they were thirsty, and as soon as they didn't get what they wanted right when they wanted it, they started questioning everything about the Exodus, everything about leaving Egypt. And they looked around and they're saying, Moses, did you not think through this? Where is the water? And it provoked God to anger. Every complaint of Israel, every grumbling of their heart added layer after layer of callousness around their heart. We have to fight against disobedience and our unwillingness to hear God's voice. Because as the Holy Spirit says, what that means is that you and I have no excuse. We have the word of God. If you don't have your own Bible, there's one in front of you. You can take that and it's free on the internet. If you don't have internet, you can come up to the church and use the Wi-Fi for free. We have no excuse to not know the word of God. We have no excuse for disobedience. And yet that's where Israel was. And we look back to them and we think, how could they be so dumb? How could they miss it? And yet here we are today, missing the same things that they missed. Disobedience, when prolonged in your life, will always lead to deception. We must fight against disobedience, but we must fight against deception. You see, this is the progression of a hardening heart. You move from disobedience to deception. And I want you to look at this. If disobedience is when you act according to your own desires, deception is when you believe that your personal desires are better than the Lord's. You start deceiving yourself when you think, no, this is good for me. 
No, this is a good thing. I know what God's word says. Like, I understand that the people in the church may be upset about it, but this is what I think is best for me. It's the first step of deception when we start hearing things like that. No longer is it just a complaint or a grumbling, but now it is an active step toward deception to make ourselves believe that our sin is okay before a holy God. This is an act of the enemy himself to make you believe that your sin is no big deal, that my sin is no big deal. And when the church gets to a place to where we are complacent about our sin, it is because we are complacent about the holiness of God and we have betrayed, we have deceived ourselves into believing it is no big deal because God is gonna save me anyways. He's gonna forgive me anyways. And listen, this is nothing different than we have seen through the centuries, but it is time for the people of God to wake up and that we are not walking in disobedience, we are not walking in deception, that we fight against these things because we are fighting for the holiness and character of an almighty God. And every time we walk in disobedience and we deceive ourselves, we start to validate our sin. We start to justify our sin. And we think it's no big deal. And what we are doing is we are adding layers of callousness around our hardening heart. This is why he says in verse 12, he says, watch out. He is pleading. And it's endearing. I mean, this is loving He uses familial terms. He says, brothers and sisters, watch out. Don't step in the way that your ancestors did. Watch out for deception. Watch out. The enemy is lurking at your door. He is a roaming and roaring lion seeking whoever he can devour. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be any of you, an evil, this unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Do you see the test here? You wanna walk in disobedience? You wanna walk in deception? You're only showing you don't belong to the house of God. The fight is not going to save you. The fight is proving that you belong. The mortification of sin, the killing of disobedience, the killing of deception. It allows you to know that you belong. How do we do this? He gives us two things. First, that we are to fight with daily encouragement. I'm telling you right now, every single person in this room is desperate for encouragement. No one can escape it. It's because it's a way God designed you. And the reason why the Lord gave us the church among many reasons was that so we could reflect the gospel, that the gospel that is invisible would become visible in the church. But it is also to edify the saints, to exhort one another in Christ's likeness, to encourage each other in the faith. But here's the problem about encouragement. Encouragement doesn't come to the unknown. True encouragement can only come to those who are known by the church. This is what I mean by that. If we have a tendency to slip in and slip out and do our best to be unnoticed by people, you're going to lack encouragement from the people of God. This is why connect groups are vital 
for your walk with Christ. No one cares about how many people we have in connect groups. That is not something that at the end of eternity, anyone's going to give two hoots about. What they are going to care about is how did you encourage your brothers and sisters? How did you help them to become more like Christ? How did you encourage those who are disheartened? How did you encourage those who are walking in disobedience and walking in deception? How did you encourage them to step out of that? You can only encourage those you know. Therefore, get to know one another in a connect group. It's hard to know people in this room at that level. We need community together. And here's what complaining and grumbling does as we see in the wilderness is that it is the greatest discouragement to the church that you could participate in. And think about those who are outside the church who are supposed to see the gospel of Jesus in you, in me. Listen, you are not guilty. I am guilty. I think about the smallest complaints in my life and how that just allows callousness to to build in my heart and my heart just becomes more and more hard. I think about complaining just about the traffic just wish we could do something about it, guys. <laughs> Every complaint that I participate in is a willingness to participate with the enemy rather than with Christ. Do not minimize the destructive power of our complaining. And do not minimize the constructive power of your encouragement. Our job is to encourage each other in Christ's likeness, in the faith. And we are to do this not just with encouragement, but with exercise. You may be thinking, I hate exercise. I am thinking the same thing. My brother Johnny right here is very disappointed in me, what I just said. But we have to fight with daily exercise. And I'm not talking about just lifting weights and running, doing all the things that everybody loves. I'm talking about a daily exercise with Christ. A daily discipline to follow after him. Because for encouragement, it requires discipline of God's people. That It requires you to show up to be with God's people. It requires you to show up to connect group. It requires us to to serve when we don't feel like it. This is why it requires discipline because it's hard. Listen, I am more and more uh, in this camp of believing that, that the Lord's day was never meant to be convenient for you or for me. You, you want to have the greatest complaints or the greatest grumblings? Let's just make any change about the Lord's day. And everybody comes out of the woodworks. I mean, can you imagine if Moses, as he's walking the people out of the Exodus, and, and they're looking at Moses, they're like, I cannot believe we did it at this time. Do you not understand I have lunch? I cannot believe that it's requiring us to just sit here this long. I cannot believe that we're singing these songs. Okay, and it goes on and on and on and on. Listen, this is adding the calluses and the hardness of our heart. This is not exercising with Christ. This is just exercising our flesh and letting all around us see it very clearly. The Lord's day was meant to be inconvenient. Because it reminds us that you and I are not in charge. It reminds us that this day is about the Lord. It's not about me being weak. It's not about me being tired. It's not about how good the sermon was. It's not about how good the music was. It's not about the latest event. It's not about the latest technology. It is about knowing Jesus Christ, worshiping him, exalting him. And anytime we come in this room, anytime we gather together, that is the job of God's people. And every time we don't, we are not participating with Christ. We are participating against Christ. 
That's how important this is. We must be diligent to be disciplined and so that at the end of time, we will continue to fight against disbelief. Do you see how he ends it here? He ends it in this way. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? If not to those who disobeyed the rest being the promised land. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now this is a believing Israel. So what is, how do these things work together? He's not necessarily talking about their belief in recognizing that Jehovah God is their God. They believed in God. They believed that they were his people. The unbelief here is not taking every word that God speaks as applicable to us. What does this mean? Our unbelief is shown when we tiptoe around our disobedience, when we continue to walk in deception, when we don't fight to encourage each other, when we don't fight to exercise our disciplines with one another, and we just continue to fall off in disbelief. And once again, this is not conditional of becoming, but what he is making clear is that you will know that you are not saved if you did not continue in the faith. You will know that you are not saved if you just continue to walk in disobedience and deception and you have no prick of the Spirit of God in your heart that would draw you toward repentance. You are living a very religious life. You have no relationship with Jesus Christ. This is unbelief. How many people in the church today will recognize there is a savior, they'll recognize there is a God, they'll recognize even that they are sinful, but they do not repent and surrender, therefore they are not in the house of God that Jesus alone is building. Will you just bow your head and just close your eyes just for a moment? And I just wanna ask you, for you to look introspectively about where you are personally. That you would ask of the Lord, God, would you show me whether or not I'm walking in disobedience, whether I'm walking in deception? And Father, would you draw me to repentance? Some of us in the room we know we belong to the family of God. We know we belong, that we are sure of our salvation, but we also recognize that we are walking in disobedience. We're walking in deception. We're not encouraging one another in the faith. We're not exercising these daily disciplines to grow in the faith. And you just need a renewed thirst for God. Let us pray with you. Those in the room that you know that you are just absent of having this belonging, that you've done everything possible to try to work your way in the church or work your way in the faith. You've, you've tried different things, but you know deep down you don't belong to the family of God and you need to give your life to Jesus today. Whatever decision you need to make, we wanna help you take that next step Heavenly Father, we ask you right now, Lord, that you would speak to those who do not have you as their Savior. God, that you would speak to us who, Father, we've given our life to you, we have surrendered to you, you have saved us. God, will you show us right now any deception, any disobedience. Father, we don't want to be like those that Psalm 95 speaks of. Father, we don't want to walk and sin and rebellion. So Father, forgive us and speak to us. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.